so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we, what we do at NASA Goddard uh, in terms of our climate change work, which is really our, our main thrust. Um, and I don't know how much you know about why NASA does climate work. Um, we built satellites and we look at the Earth and we built the satellites for NOAA and we build the uh, satellites for the USGS that look at the Earth. Um, and the main thing we do with these is try to understand what's going on on Earth. It's a pretty big organization. Um, and there's just a lot of ex exciting stuff that we do. But these are the, are the main things we try to understand with climate is what's going on, how will it affect us, uh, how is the climate changing, why, uh, how is it going to affect ecosystems, and what can we do. This is, this is sort of the quintess quintess quintessential uh, background piece of information here about the climate is that this is the climate record after the, at, over the past uh, half million years. And this, all this information comes from ice cores from Antarctica, and you can see on the bottom there's a sawtooth uh, temperature record that varies uh, between these peaks that are up at around the, con the, the current level of of, the temp of Earth's temperature to a temperature that's about eight or 10 degrees colder than that. And during those times, um, there are ice ages. It's only about eight, eight, 10 degrees colder centigrade, colder than we ha are right now. And during those times, it's cold, it's dry, it's windy, it's dusty. Um, at the same time, this isn't a condition that's kept humans from living. Uh, we've existed for the past couple hundred thousand years. Uh, so uh, we've gone through a couple of ice ages, and actually the great expansion of humans around the, the world occurred before this last interglacial, which is this area, right over, this warmer time right here, uh, which is the last 10,000 years. The big expansion of humans actually was a little prior to that when the Bering Strait was bare, and you could walk across that, and humans made it to the made it to uh, the Americas. Um, er, so we've survived a lot of this. But the very interesting thing about this, this plot with all these different um, curves on it is that there also is uh, traces from greenhouse gases. These are, here's CO2 here in the blue and, and methane in the green. And what we see, if you look at the, the traces of temperature and the greenhouse gases over this great length of time, what you see is that the way things worked is the temperature would change and then the greenhouse gases would change. So the physical, biological process, cause and effect, was the temperature was driving what was going on. And the reason for that, of course, had to do with what's called the Milankovitch cycle, which has to do with the orbit of Earth, which isn't quite round, and the, where is Jupiter and the other giant planets? Are they pulling us a little bit out of round to a little bit elliptical? And, how, and where are the continents, and how does radiation get absorbed on Earth? A complicated thing, but that's the best explanation we have for this climate change thing that goes on. The thing that, that is scary about this, and this is right out of, uh, well, Jim Hansen's work, which then made it into Al Gore's movie. I don't know how many of you saw that. But in, since the industrial age, the greenhouse gases are driving the, the temperature. So the physical, biological process has been swapped over. And that's what's, what's uh, scary to the scientific community because we don't know where it's going to go. And with a growing human population and growing economic activity, the rate at which we emit these gases is not going to do anything but go up unless we take some action. So let me quickly go through how we know about greenhouse gases. Um, these measurements, actually the knowledge about greenhouse gases uh, go back to the 1820s when scientists in Europe were beginning to look at the greenhouse gas concept and people, uh, actually the Fourier analysis uh, technique, which is a way of looking at random processes and look for, looking for regularity in what appear to be pseudo-random processes. This was stuff that Joseph Fourier did in Paris back in the early 1800s. And at that time, he'd already figured out, and other people had figured out back about then, that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas and that industrial activity would, would increase the amount of carbon dioxide and raise the temperature. So this is nothing new. 
and we've known it for a long time. Uh, these are measurements, I'm sure you've seen a lot of them, the, the annual uh, measurements of carbon dioxide from the top of Mauna Loa, and in the winter, the uh, amount of carbon dioxide goes up because the northern hemisphere trees become dormant. In the summer, it goes down because the trees are going and the way, where they get their carbon to grow is out of the atmosphere. And so there's an annual cycle. Um, so this has all been understood for a long time. This is a plot of how uh, the temperature is changing uh, on Earth. These are just, it's a summary of all sorts of measurements. This is put together by Jim Hansen, one of our scientists. I'm sure you all know his name. And so what you see up in the graph is temperature de departures from, the, the, from an average temperature with red being warmer and blue being cooler. And we started that with a bunch of blue ones. And, and in the bottom we have a graph here where, again, the blue is colder than this average temperature over this period from 1860 to now. And we, as you see, as time goes on, we're getting gradually warmer. And um, I'll just skip to where I'm going to end up in the talk, which is what can we do about it and how do you talk to people about it, and I'll get to that at the very end of this. So we've gotten a lot warmer, a lot being a few degrees. The scale over here is about one and a half degrees. It's not a big scale, but remember that the temperature change between ice ages and non-ice ages is about eight, nine, ten degrees, something like that. This is a plot of temperature changes during the uh, industrial age, and the, um, the red is northern hemisphere, the blue is southern hemisphere, and there's a five-year running average for the solid curves, and you can see the year-to-year -year variations. And one of the things to point out right here is any year, from one year to another, there's huge variation, and that's because of the way the weather and the short-term climate works is the Earth is a big fluid system, and the oceans and the atmosphere, you can just think of it sloshing around like water in the bathtub, and the slosh period is pretty long. It's a year or two or a few years, depending on what you're talking about. Sort of the long end is El Nino's, in which the slosh period is about four years between El Nino and another one. Now, the reason the southern hemisphere is a lot different um, is that the location of the continents is really different in the northern and southern hemisphere. Most of the land is in the northern hemisphere. That's where no, most of the vegetation is. And the Arctic Ocean is fairly isolated from the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. So um, you have land, land going up close to the pole. Different things happen there. Whereas in the southern hemisphere, you have this ocean that goes all the way around the, the Antarctic continent and the the water is, is, the air is just zipping around there. There's a huge vortex going around Antarctica. There are huge waves, regularly 40 to 60 foot waves in the Southern Ocean. I've never been there. A friend of mine is on a ship right now going there. Um, but you really get pounded when you get there. So the dynamics of the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere are really, bit, really different. And we'll come back to that. But let's look at the Arctic sea ice here. These are measurements we make using polar orbiting satellites. So it's going around the pole and the Earth is turning underneath it. And we can measure with, actually we use microwaves instead of using uh, other things. We use microwaves because they can look through the clouds to the ocean surface and we measure the extent of the sea ice. And what we see is over many years, there was a lot of fluctuation and gradual decrease in the amount of sea ice. But then, uh, after about 2000, uh, there's a pretty big decrease in the amount of sea ice. And in 2007 was the first time in recorded history where the Northwest Passage, the famed Northwest Passage that the Europeans were searching for for all those years and never found, well, there it is. It opened up in 2007. It has been open and being used for shipping every year since then. And um, Actually, if you, well, we want to go on to the next one here, if I can get it to do that. If you include 2008, 9, 10, you see that actually there's some curvature to this, this line here. And the question is, where are we going to get to no sea ice? Now, the reason that's important is when the Arctic Ocean is covered with ice, more than 90% of the solar radiation is just reflected back into space. When, it's, when there's no ice there, over 90% is absorbed into the water. 
And so if you've got a situation where you're gradually losing ice, you have a runaway heating process because every year you're going to collect more ice in that, more heat in that ocean. And that's what we see here. And with this curvature, we know that it's not going to be that long before we, at the minimum, you have no ice in the Arctic Ocean. The reason we worry about that is we don't quite know what will happen to uh, the global heat balance and circulations. And I'll get back to that in a little bit. But it is a, a, uh, an issue of concern. In Antarctica, actually, due to this vortex around the Antarctica and the fact that there's a big ocean current around uh, Antarctica too, a lot of flow in the ocean and in the air, um, the sea ice is actually growing slightly and we're trying to understand that. And there's some hypotheses out there and I, don't, and I don't think there really is an answer at this time. However, if we look at the ice in the ice sheet on Greenland and the big ice sheet on Antarctica, in both cases, the amount of ice, ice is flowing into the ocean. And uh, the rate at which it's flowing in is increasing slowly as time goes on. So even though the, the sea ice is not responding in the same way in the southern hemisphere as the north, what's going on in general on the continent of Antarctica or the subcontinent of Greenland is the same thing that we're having a lot of flow into the ocean. Now, I'll go through a bunch of other examples of just what we're seeing before I get back to um, how we put all this together. Another, another thing we see as time goes on is the distribution of rainfall is changing around the Earth. This is from uh, one of the IPCC reports. I guess this isn't even the last one. This is the one before that, but I like this picture better than the one out of the last one. It's the same result. <laughs> Um, I just thought it was a more accessible picture. What it shows is all this green area up at the top. This is more precipitation. So more rain, more snow in the northern latitudes. This is where all the continents are. The equator, by the way, you know, it's nice to think of it as here, but it's actually right down here at the Amazon uh, ri River output going through Madagascar, through um, here, through Borneo and the like, um, and less rain around the equator. So, and the reason for this is that as you heat up the ocean, you basically increase the size of, of some of these uh, uh, circulation cells around the Earth. This is a, a picture that's supposed to demonstrate the, the uh, circulation of air around the Earth. Basically, along the equator, you have an updraft. And then you get this circulation cell that goes all around the Earth. And um, as these grow, it pushes some of these others a bit northward. So, and the storm tracks and the precipitation move a little bit towards the poles as a result of that. Um, due to these sort of large scale things, we see some other things happen that have to do with some of the large scale sloshing of the atmosphere and ocean. And one of the big, big ones that I've mentioned uh, just a minute ago was the El Nino. Um, this is a plot of what's called the Southern Oscillation Index. Basically, it shows you when you're having El Ninos and when you're having La Ninas. Uh, El Nino is a situation in which the hot spot of the ocean, uh, which is usually uh, around New Guinea and just to the west of that, moves way out over the center of the ocean. Now this is an area of the ocean where the water temperature is a little bit over 90 degrees. Um, so you can walk into the ocean there and it's just comfortable. I mean, you just barely feel the slightest bit of cooling when you get into the ocean there. You spend hours in the water. And um, it's very nice to go swimming and skin diving there. When that moves off to the to the center of the ocean, a whole lot of big convective storms move with it. And that changes global circulation patterns and slips stuff around the Earth. And, and so the, the, the hot spot of the ocean moves you know, 40, 50 degrees to the, to the east. And all these Earth's precipitation systems move with it. And that's why when an El Nino happens, the coast of California gets a lot of rain that usually hits further north on the, on the coast of California, and it changes precipitation patterns across the U.S. and all sorts of places. And the point of this is there seems to be some kind of a trend in the occurrence of El Ninos as a result of global warming. Now, I don't know the cause and effect here. I don't think anybody does yet. And I'm pretty sure 
We have people who do modeling, we have people who do measurements, all sorts of things at Goddard. I haven't heard any explanation that showed that the models show this. There are some model results that suggest this. So we don't understand. This is another unanswered question. But it's something that we see in the data. So this, is, this is from the um, National Weather Service. Um, the National Weather Service measures how hard it rains all over the place. And they have criteria for light rain, mist, medium rain, heavy rain, extreme rain. And this is a plot of the percent of rain in the United States that is due to what they call heavy rainfall, heavier than some amount. And I don't remember whether it's an inch an hour or four inches an hour. Um, an inch an hour being you run from your car into the house and the four inches being you don't. You wait for that to go by. <laughs> That's about the difference there. But it, this includes all of that. And what it says is, is that over this period of, of 90 years about, the percent of precip due to heavy rain is increasing. Now, this is something the models also show that with global warming, you should get more heavy rain and heavier rain events. Um, the other thing that happens is the, the reverse of that is the frequency of drought is increasing. And if you just look around at the, at the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is plotted at the bottom where uh, blue is no drought and red is a drought, um, this is a number that's going up. And I believe this is a global number. This is a plot out of the last IPCC report. And the interesting thing about this is, is in uh, the way this chicken comes home to roost is well, I used to live in, in Boulder. I worked at NCAR. Nice place to live. People used to say, are you crazy to move to DC? I like it here, actually. But I was on a volunteer fire department there for 20 years. And I fought a lot of forest fires. And as time went on, I was fighting more forest fires. And I actually, it turns out that uh, a guy named Drew, Drew Schindel, who's one of our scientists up in, in New York City at GISS, did, has done some papers on this, and I took a look at this, and it's all due to the fact that there's more drought in the southwest United States. The temperature is going up. And remember the precipitation? Precipitation amount is going down. And all of these things create a much more flammable uh, earth surface and, and biosphere. And uh, it's, it's very clear, and actually, if you just go take that you know, huge regional area of southwest United States, and just pull it down to Boulder County. I was back there last spring, and I asked some folks, do you have any statistics for fire incidents in Boulder County over the last 30 years? And in you know, the beginning of the 30 years, there were, fi there were intermittent fires, which is what I remember, but not many. But we got later, there were more fires and bigger fires as time was going on. And this is going on all over the Southwest. So this is something that we noticed as firefighters. Another thing we're seeing, this is uh, from Rutgers University. There's a snow, a snow lab there. They study uh, how much snow there is. And I just pulled this off their website. This is a plot of northern hemisphere snow cover over the period from 1966 or 67 up to 04. And what it shows that snow is that the snow cover is, has been reduced one to two days per year since the early 70s. One to two days a year doesn't sound like much until you multiply that by the number of years. You're dealing with several months of less snow cover. And this is a positive feedback to warming. Because remember, the snow reflects the light. And it, I looked at a whole bunch of other areas. I just used this particular one. I could have taken North America. I could have taken Canada. I could have taken Nebraska. It doesn't, didn't much matter. You got this, about the same result. Another a way this manifests, the heating and changes in precipitation man, manifest themselves are in, in stream flow, is if you look at summer stream flow um, and I'll have to remake this plot using data that comes closer to today. But um, the summer stream flow is decreasing. And that's because in the past, uh, the, this happens to be from California, uh, but you could get similar plots all, sort of the, all over the place. In the past, more water was stored as snow in the winter. And so it didn't come down the river. But now it's coming down more if it's coming down as rain, so it already has come down the river. 
And, and so the winter, winter stream flow is increasing and the summer stream flow is decreasing. Now, so there are all these things that are happening to precipitation with changes in precipitation, storm intensity, snowfall, runoff, and all this stuff. Oh yeah, and sea level is rising, but that won't affect us too much in Washington, not for quite a while. I just throw this in about how this affects a, sort of a common person. This is a picture of my cousin's farm. It's on the San Joaquin River in the Central Valley of California. Um, her house is this white dot right here. This is an old slough of the river. The river doesn't go there anymore. And so I visit her and I talk and she's a farmer and she uses irrigation water and she's really interested in all the problems relating to this. And she's very aware about less snow melt, about the difficulty of getting more water. Is she going to have enough water for a second crop? And this is a major, major agricultural area. Um, so, you know, it affects a lot of people. It affects whole ecosystems. So you've seen this pic those pictures in a movie. You've seen that picture. And I'll just put up the pictures of the polar bears. They are a great icon for the whole ecosystem from the phytoplankton, which are the little plants in the, in the ocean, up through the, the, the animals that eat the phytoplankton, to the sea otters, to the seals, to the polar bears. The whole ecosystem is changing, and this is a good icon for all sorts of other ecosystems that are moving poleward as time goes on. So let me get into what we can do about it and what humans are, what humans are doing. We're affecting the earth. This is a picture I took near Shanghai a few years ago. And I like it because the foreground is traditional agriculture, which isn't all that different than what was there before there was traditional agriculture, except there are probably more trees. And behind that is um, there's some apartment buildings. And then some, those are just like eight, nine stories. And then there's some much bigger ones. These are like over 20 story apartment buildings. And they're there because there's a big factory, factory out of the picture. And this is, a, it's a good example for the sort of the complexity of human activities. And so we're doing all these things to the earth and I don't want to blame the Chinese. I mean, we're all doing it, we're all in it together. But we're emitting these greenhouse gases, we're emitting the aerosols, which is dust, black carbon from combustion and things like that. Some of the aerosols reflect uh, sunlight, black carbon lands on things and absorbs it. It's very complicated. Changes in cloudiness, uh, land use changes, such as you saw in this picture, and then the effects on water. So there are all these different components. And, and if, so if you look, this is just a plot out of the last IPCC run. Um, there are the greenhouse components. Red in this side of zero is something that is warming. Uh, ozone, there are tropospheric ozone aspects that warm, stratospheric that cool. I'll just skip, gland use has effects. Aerosols, most of the aerosols, aerosols, that is the dust in the atmosphere, actually reflects sunlight back up into the sky. So that tends to be a cooling effect. But they have cloud effects on clouds also, which we don't understand very well. Because lots of little dust makes lots more little raindrops, which makes the clouds more reflective. And that's the source of, of one of the there ain't nothing happening theories from some of the people who, some of the very few scientists who uh, are having trouble with this. So, there's a lot, a, a lot of different and complex aspects of this whole problem. And I'll just say the sun is not one of the culprits to, to look at. The sun's being pretty constant through solar cycles and the like. There's this net anthropogenic effect, though, down here. How do we know what's going on? Because we've got climate, mo we have the measurements, which are, are you know, circumstantial evidence that a whole lot's happening and, uh, and there's heating going on and all the things you would expect with heating are happening to water in particular. It's the easiest way to trace through all of this. We can check our models against all of this and we can check how they're running by simulating past climate events. So this is a plot of, of um, observations, which is the red line, which goes up to here, 200. This was, this was from about... Well, it's only supposed to go up, is it green goes up, I'm sorry. Green goes up just past 2000, which is when this, this plot came from, I think 2004 or five. Um, the red is a composite of five different climate model runs, and we know a whole lot about what happened to Earth 
uh, since the industrial age. We've been recording it quite well. And so we can actually model all this stuff. This is, this is a, vol a volcano going off here. That's another volcano going off. When a volcano goes off, it puts a lot of spews, a lot of stuff up in the stratosphere and cools off the earth, um, et cetera. So we can actually simulate that pretty well. And what we don't know is what's going to happen in the future, which is pretty much dependent on humans. And there are a bunch of different scenarios with uh, things that could happen. Um, this is a scenario where they just took some of this or these Earth events and just ran them all out. Um, and basically, warmer is more people in development, and cooler is less. Now, all of this could be fine because it could just warm up the Earth and it might just move precipitation north or northward, and we might all have to move with it or something. But there are a bunch of reasons why, as scientists, we're really concerned is and here are, are some of them with ecosystems moving. The big concern, though, has to do with tipping points. Tipping points such as what turns on or off an ice age. The Earth is mostly in an ice age, but every once in a while we get a non-ice age event such as we are living in right now in this comfortable Earth. And we, we think we understand that. But something, a very small effect, and solar radiation, due to the ellipticity of the orbits of the Earth, which is just a few percent, switch this on and off. And so what happens if we lose all the, the Arctic sea ice? We, haven't, we don't have data to, to back up whatever our models say. So this is, there's a big unknown in, in how all that works. And you know, I'll just finish this up with talking about the possibility of making changes. Because there are a lot of things we can do to respond to this. There's some things we're not going to do very effectively. And I'll also mention a really good session at the AGU conference, which was amazing. Still, it's amazing to me how you can get into a crowd of 10,000 people and find somebody, but that's another topic. Um, there are a lot of things that we can do. And, and the, the concern about reacting to climate change, in my view, mostly centers on fear that we can't do anything or that it will be too expensive to do anything or for some people that I won't be as rich if I do anything or my life won't be economically quite as good or something like that. And they're all legitimate concerns. But there are things we can do and, and uh, you know, this is just a list of them and I'll, I'll go over them. You can read this slide and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about the opportunity to make changes, because there are big opportunities, and there is very strong demonstrative evidence, which I'll show you, which shows that we humans, as a country and as a global society, can make those decisions and have made those decisions. So I really applaud the climate outreach stuff that I heard you talk about a little earlier. It's really, really important. And it's all really important to think about how we talk about it. And I'll get back to that. There are multiple things we can do. This is, it happens to be a picture of the front of my house. Now, the house is not a model for energy consumption. It was built in 1923. The insulation of the walls consists of air between the plaster and the exterior sheathing. And when it blows really hard, you can feel air squirting through. And these are the original windows. But something I could do is I could sign up for um, clean currents, I could actually sign it up through my church and they got a little money from clean currents. And clean currents is an outfit that will sell you um, allegedly green energy. And somewhere in there I saw that they just guarantee it to be so much green and so much as wherever else they get the energy to then supply to Pepco that then gives you the energy. The fact is that they actually sell it to me at a little less than I was paying Pepco for the same energy. I'm going to save 10% on the energy that comes. Now, my bill won't go down that much because Pepco still charges me to deliver it. But you know, that's something that, that says that there was an economic opportunity because what Clean Currents has done is they realized they could cut their profits a little bit because I think we all know just from what we read in the paper that all of these alternative energy sources are right now a little bit more expensive than coal. So they must be paying more, but they're selling it to me for less, and I know they're in business. So there's a business model that has somebody making money, maybe a little less money. So it says there's an opportunity there. So 
what, what energy you use, what you eat and what you drive. Um, if you're eating mostly meat, you're using, you're using food twice to get it into your mouth. What you drive, energy conservation, that's the biggest thing you can do. I mean, I need to put new windows in my house, and only because it's going to cost 20,000 bucks, so I've got to figure out when am I going to do that. But it'll happen in another year or two. Um, recycling, that is, don't use energy you don't have to use. Um, and how you vote, I won't say anything about that, but that has, that's an important thing. When you respond to climate change opposition, and this, this was just, there was a wonderful, wonderful session at AGU, and, and a bunch of people, uh, including Ed Maybach from uh, George Mason, talked. And I just love this New Yorker cover, uh, which, you know, it, to me, it was just so representative of the folks who don't want anything to change for whatever reason. Um, the point that was made in that presentation by Ed and by another a bunch of other people is that when you respond to climate change opposition, most people come up and say, is it really happening? They're not going to argue with you. Some of them will. The ones who want to argue with you will come up and say, no, I don't believe in that. Um, and then you get, it, it, and you get into a discussion that's very hard for most of us at least in the scientific community, because we're used to having a, a debate time to, type of discussion where we're going <coughs> to present evidence, they're going to present evidence, and whoever's got the better evidence will carry the day. And that's not the discussion you're in with people who come up and say, it, it's not true and it's a big lie. They want to win the argument and they don't care how they're going to do it. And that's at least just my opinion about where you are. So if you get into an argument with them that's a fact-based argument about the climate facts, you're not going to go anywhere with that. What you can say, though, in, is, is to address um, factual, inc factual incorrect things uh, that they will say. Top, top thing being to say that most scientists by far, and this is less than 2%, um, believe humans and anthropogenically caused, humans are causing climate change. And this is, this is quite clear. The studies have been done by Maybach and other social scientists who study the social science of climate change. And even the ones who will argue about anthropogenic causation will admit, if you push on them, they will all admit, yeah, the Earth is warming, and these other things are happening, because the data shows that, and they kind of got to believe in that. So the science community believes all of these things I talked about, about what we observe, they're happening. There's this tiny little group that will, doesn't want to admit that humans are doing it. The point is that there are a whole bunch of, of positive responses to climate change effect, uh, events, and that's the thing that's so important to, to emphasize when you address these folks, is that they, the economic opportunities, I mean, witness clean currents. And, um, you know, frankly, they saw an opportunity, they wanted to make money, there were gonna be a lot more people trying to make money off of other ways of making less polluting um, uh, energy. There are health benefits around the world, uh, huge, huge health benefits, and those have been uh, uh, dealt with. The next two are right out of DOD and the CIA and, and, and National Security Agency. Serious concerns about human migration and, and, and security. And this gets back to that plot where um, about the, the changes in temperature, if we have more uh, more collaboration, a more uh, uh, helpful world, we will deal with these problems. And finally, improve environmental quality. The only point there, though, is one of the rules, rules of, of uh, environmental implementation, uh, sort of an experiential rule that I've heard, is that you, anytime you get into an argument about environment versus money, the money wins. So that's not an... That's, in, in itself, not a good argument. Um, I want to close here with the opportunity there in the demonstration that people have done things. This is a plot of GDP per capita and kilowatt use per capita. And what you see is the here's the USA. We have huge GDP. We use a lot of power right up there with Canada. The, he hardly uses any more, and they're a lot further north and a lot colder. Um, my daughter lives in Germany. I know that the quality of life there is quite, quite good in France. I've spent a lot of time in those countries, some in the UK. Uh, about half the energy use 
Okay, now they figured out a way of living that has to do with transportation, how much you heat your house, and things like that. Small refrigerators, small washing machines, on and on and on and on. It's the whole, whole way everything is put together. Smaller cars. Um, this says that there's an opportunity there for us to cut our energy consumption in half in this country without having any significant co cost um, in terms of quality of life. Two examples from actual things that globally happened. Here uh, is a plot of temperature versus the time from during the Industrial Age. And here is a point where the, the temperature was going up, 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 and up, and up, and up. And all of a sudden, uh, he, in this length of time here, um, a bunch of things happen. The, 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 the war, there's the Second World War that produced a, a bunch of... I lost the, the, there we go, got it back. Uh, so there's a change there. But the Clean Air Act's when it got put in in the 60s. And, and as soon as the Clean Air Act's got in, implemented, we stopped polluting the air with all those, um, all, that, all those aerosols. Well, those aerosols had been reflecting the sunlight. We cut them out, and the heating started again. So we cleaned up the environment, and we went back to the heating from greenhouse gases. So two points to this graph. One is that there was an effect there, and we know what the effect was, and it had an effect on global temperatures. But the other is that worldwide, we went and cleaned up the environment, which was a good thing. And we decided to do that. It happened in, in the 60s because of, of the environmental movement and worry about acid rain and forests turning brown and all of that stuff. What we did here in this country then went to Europe, and they cleaned up their act. So this says we can make global environmental decisions. This is the other example, and this has with the Montreal Protocol. Uh, it was discovered uh, that, um, that oz the ozone hole was uh, uh, being formed and that the, the, the need to get rid of chlorofluorocarbons and uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, the, the, I'm not, it's not the social, political reasons why this worked, I'm not quite sure about. I know one of the early statements is consumers worldwide believed that there was a problem with the ozone hole and it switched over, marketing switched them, oh, don't worry about that, we can use a pump spray. And people did it. Now, why they did it, I don't know. There wasn't any big movement, but that's the history of what happened. But the Montreal Protocol did get put in place, and chlor chlorofluorocarbons did get banned. And, and that turns out to have been a very effective thing and a very important thing, because had we not done that, we would have come up to, we would have on this path to very high levels of chlorofluorocarbons, which were serious greenhouse gases, but they were also going to ruin the, ruin the ozone, and then we we're going to have a lot of UV radiation, and we we're all going to get skin cancer, not all of us, but we're going to have a lot of skin cancer, and plants were going to have a hard time growing. And we can, there was a great talk about that at AGU also. Paul Newman, one of our scientists, made that talk. Again, an international protocol that is still in effect today, and actually as of the last... Um, climate summit in Durban, it is being used to continue some of the, the Montreal Protocol is being used to continue some of the regulations from Kyoto. So the point is, it's not hopeless to do something, and it's not necessarily economically a negative thing. It's a positive thing, and the whole issue is how do we communicate this? We've got to change policy. We all got to work for it. Thank you.